Shalom. Today we are returning to the lesson on the uses of the Aleph Tav. We have already looked at uh, the this combination of letters as a grammatical marker for the direct object. We've looked at it uh, in a standalone form, in a form attached to the Vav, and we've looked at it attached to personal pronouns. And we're going to continue today, and we're going to talk about actually trying to count the Aleph Tavs. The Aleph Tav appears in the very first verse in Bereshit, Bereshit bara Elohim, et HaShemayim v'et HaAretz. And just as a grammatical breakdown, Bereshit in the beginning or in a beginning, bara created Elohim, et, what did he create? HaShemayim, the heavens, v'et, what else did he create? HaAretz, the earth. In John 1, we see, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. The same was in the beginning with God. All things were made by Him, and without Him was not anything made that was made. So this strategic placement in Bereshit of this Aleph Tav uh, kind of resonates with this idea in John that in the beginning, Bereshit, bara created Elohim, Aleph Tav. Oh, look, here is this word, this Aleph Tav, this beginning and ending, as Yeshua defined himself, the Aleph and the Omega, uh, right in the beginning of Bereshit. So it's possible that there is a, a pointing, a pointing of the Aleph Tav to Yeshua. And so we want to investigate a little bit about that today. So is it uh, possible to actually count all the Aleph Tavs that are in Tanakh? As we've already seen, there it appears in several different formats. It appears uh, standing by itself, hyphenated to another word, with a Vav or attached to a personal pronoun. So there are literally thousands of Aleph Tavs. Uh, as the direct object marker in Tanakh. Uh, there's over 3,000 in the first five books of Moses. So this is a pretty um, large task if we mean to undertake it. We do find some interesting uh, places. This is uh, the story of, of Joseph being uh, taken by his brothers and thrown into a pit. And we can see that just in this small story, all the Aleph Tavs, these are not standalones. Most of them are hyphenated or they have a Vav. Um, and in the midst of this story, you can count them. There are 12. That's kind of interesting. Is it even possible to count the number of standalone Aleph Tavs? Maybe these have more significance than the other ones. Um, we're going to talk about the process of recension. Recension means taking different copies of the manuscripts and see how they compare to each other. We like to think of Tanakh as being this monolithic, perfectly symmetrical across time document, and it is not. There are different scribal usages in the many, many different texts. There was a man named Jacob and Chaim uh, who, in the 1500s collected as many manuscripts of the Old Testament as he could find from around the world, and he began to collate them to produce the most complete Bible available at that time. That Bible was published by Daniel Bomberg in Venice, and it was the first document to present a complete Masora and was the only authorized Masoretic recension. And in time, it became the Textus Receptus of the Old Testament. The word Masora means to hand down, to pass across from one person to another. So when we talk about the Masoretic text of that time, uh, this man, Jacob and Chaim, had taken all these different documents and he began to correlate them one to the other to see uh, what the usages were in the different documents. And he put them together in this Masoretic recension. 
His work was continued by a Jewish believer named David Ginsburg, who was born in Wausau. He was born to a Jewish family. I think he converted around the time he was 15 or 19. He became a believer, and uh, he set out to collate and correct the Masoretic text and to st- in order to study the Hebrew text. He traveled all over Europe and found as much material as he could, and then he set about examining the works of the Masora to see how the documents, again, compared one with another. Rather than going in and amending the text to say, oh, this is the way it should be, um, which was uh, what was commonly practiced in the New Testament work, Ginsburg uh, wrote a document, which we can see in a minute, it's available online, showing, footnoting all the different changes and showing all the documents. He used about 75 different documents to do his recension, and he made footnotes saying, well, in these group of documents it's written this way and in these group of documents it's written another way and uh, so his critical edition of the Hebrew Bible was based on the work of Ben Chaim and was published in the um, 1800s in England. Now you can see Ginsburg entire document at this uh, web address And I have posted here a little example to show you exactly what we're talking about. uh, There's a scripture here from Genesis 1, 29. And it begins after the colon on the third line, Vayomer Elohim. And if you look down to the next line, at the end of the middle line, there's a little circle over the word Va'et. It's got a vav, it's got the olive tav, and then it's hyphenated to the next word, kol. And that little circle means there's a footnote. And so I have posted, pasted the footnote at the bottom of the page, and we're going to look at it so you can understand what the footnote says. Um, you see it says V29. That means verse 29. This means this is the footnote for verse 29. And it says, thus it is in uh, the the Ben Chaim Chumash in his document. And then he shows what Ben Chaim wrote. And we see it says Ve'et with a hyphen and then the call that we were talking about. Then it says the word Makaf. Makaf is that dash. Then there's a comma. And then there are two letters, Samech Aleph, with like little quotation marks in between them. When we see words in Hebrew that have those little quotation marks, that means this is not a word. Don't try and read this out of the word. Either it's going to represent a number or it's going to represent an abbreviation. In this case, it it represents the abbreviation Svarim Achirim. Svarim, Sefer, books. Achirim, other books. So in the other books that he looked at or in the other manuscripts he looked at, this phrase of et kol is written this way. It's got the vav and um, the aleph tav, but there is no makaf, there is no dash, et kol. There are many, many, many such notations about all different kinds of things, not just the aleph tavs in Ginsburg's document. But what we uh, begin to see, and what I just want you to glean from this, is that it the Torah, the Chumash that we see, is not a monolithic document across time. There are small changes in it. We're going to talk about some of those. So at one point in my life, I was uh, sort of captive somewhere. And so I spent uh, some time actually doing my own recension about the Aleph Tavs. And I used four popular Hebrew documents of Tanakh. I use the Westminster Leningrad Codex, which is available online at um, the website you see, tanakh.us. I used the uh, Sefer HaBritot, which is the parallel columns of Hebrew and English. Probably many of you have this Bible uh, that was published in Israel by the Israeli Association for the Dissemination of Biblical Writings. The uh, Hebrew uh, Tanakh 
is a is a based on a different document than the Westminster Leningrad Codex. The English of this Bible is the New King James, and the Hebrew uh, of the New Testament in this book is a pretty new translation. Uh, sometimes people say, "Oh, well, what is the best Bible to buy? Um, what? How can we best study?" And there's really not a great answer to that question. Um, a lot of the translations have positives and negatives. They have strong points and weak points. Uh, if you want to have a Hebrew Bible, it's good to have a Hebrew Bible if you're learning to read Hebrew. Uh, this is not an interlinear Bible. The interlinear Bibles with Hebrew that are available are, in general, somewhat difficult to read. The type is very small. They try and cram a lot of things in, uh, in on every line. Some of them have strong numbers and Hebrew words and English words. Um, you can get ones that are basically NIV translations, uh, which may be not the best English translation that's available. So it, it's hard to pick out a good Bible. If you want to carry your Old and New Testament at the same time and have the Hebrew Old Testament, um, you wind up with this kind of modern uh, Hebrew translation, which is not based on the King James at all, or even the New King James. It's, it's based on the uh, NIV, the Hebrew New Testament in this safe every tote. So it's a toss-up. Uh, <laughs> make your own decision about which Bible to buy. Uh, back to where we were, I, I did go through the uh, Sefer Harbi Tote. I used, I have a, a Tanakh that's published by Koran in Israel, which has a different base document, and also the JPS, which is available online also at Mechon Mamre. So I have correlated all these four documents concerning the standalone Aleph Tavs, and uh, if you want that electronic document, you can get in touch with me, and I'll be happy to send it to you over the internet. It's uh, very interesting, I guess, that in the Westminster Leningrad Codex, there are exactly 613 instances of the standalone Aleph Tav. These include the Kativ Kree corrections. Uh, this term, Kativ Kree, means that one thing is written, but a different thing is to be read. And so that is a whole other lesson in itself. So can we draw any significance to where these standalone Aleph Tavs are? This is my favorite one. Uh, from the Song of Songs. There are only four places where this phrase, Him whom my soul loveth, appears. They're right here in these four verses, one right after the other. And in every case, this Aleph Tav appears between Him, and which one is it? The one whom my soul loveth. So I think this is really a beautiful picture pointing to Yeshua. On the other hand, you have a standalone Aleph Tav in the midst of the verses talking about the unclean birds in Leviticus, and in the parallel verse in Deuteronomy, it's not even a standalone, it has a vav. I'm not saying there is no significance to these things, but this is the sort of discussion maybe we can have with Messiah after his return to explain the importance of these things. So we're going to go back and uh, see how do these Aleph Tavs fall out in Genesis 1? So I've lined the words up like this, and we're going to put them next to some other ideas. Here we've lined up these seven words with the seven millennia of history. And so we see that the first Aleph Tav falls out in the fourth millennium, which would be significant of the first coming of Messiah. And the second one falls out in the sixth millennium, at the end of which will be the second coming of Messiah. And here we've lined up these seven words of Breshit with the seven festivals of Yahweh. And we see that the first one falls out during Shavuot, where in one century, the people saw the fire of God on the mountain. Some of the people went and ate with God, and they received the tablets at Sinai. 
In another century, the people were filled by the Holy Spirit. So that's kind of interesting. The second occurrence falls out with uh, the Festival of Atonement, when God will rule and reign as judge, and there um, he will personally make those judgments uh, about people who have lived in the past and who are living at the time of his return. So again, I think this is something you could draw a lot out of this chart. Next time, we will continue on with other meanings for words which are spelled, specifically Aleph Tav. There are three other words. So we will do those one at a time. In the meantime, Tassimita'inayim al-Hashemayim, keep your eye on the sky, your redemption draweth nigh. Shalom.